Florence Beatrice Smith Price was born on April 9, 1887 in Little Rock, Arkansas. Her father was the only black dentist in their community and her mother a music teacher. Young Florence gave her first piano recital at the age of four and had her first composition published at age 11. Upon graduating from high school at the top of her class, Florence set her sights on higher education. At this time, in an attempt to circumvent potential racial discrimination in response to her being mixed race, she claimed Pueblo, Mexico as her hometown, registering herself as being of Mexican descent. Price earned a bachelor's degree and an artist diploma in both piano performance and organ at the New England Conservatory of Music, making her the only student in the conservatory at that time to pursue a dual major. While there, Florence studied piano and music theory with composers Frederick Converse and George Chadwick. Different from some Black people, I would dare to say most, but I'll, to be on the safe side, say some. She grew up in a sort of middle class family. Her father was a dentist uh, and an inventor. He actually serviced both uh, both white and black patients prior to Jim Crow laws being instituted. Her mother was a businesswoman and also taught her piano for some time. Uh, obviously, they had the means to support Florence Price in her training and in her upbringing from a very young age. Also, they would have visitors who were of uh, a part of the artistic community, black artistic community. And so Florence Price was exposed to a lot from a very young age. And a part, a, a, a part of that comes from uh, an idea that Dr. Raylinda Brown talks about in her, in her research, which is that the Price family were, they, they were of lighter hued skin. And so they were afforded some freedoms that a darker skinned person would not, especially prior to the institution of those Jim Crow laws. But after Jim Crow was instituted, it didn't matter how light or how dark you were. If you were black, you were black. But just, just thinking of some of the things that may have at least given her a moment or given her family uh, opportunities to earn uh, income in a way that others couldn't. So, so there was that, she had this great foundation uh, of musical training from a young age. She came from a family which had a considerable amount of wealth and privilege. Um, her father was a dentist. She's from Little Rock, Arkansas. Her father was the dentist of the mayor of Arkansas, a white mayor. Uh, it was sort of a, a not so secret secret because they didn't, he didn't want people to know that he was going to the black side of town to get his teeth done. But her father was one of the best dentists in town. He also was a polymath. He was a musician, an amateur musician. He also was a painter. He also wrote a novel. But he wrote a novel about a black woman falling in love with, I believe, a white man. And in very outwardly explored the politics of colorism in a novel. You know, so he was doing all of these things. <laughs> so she grew up in a fan, and her mother also could play piano, and she had her in piano lessons from a very young age and organ lessons. So she had access to a lot of uh, support systems, educational resources that uh, the lower and middle classes, the working classes, did not necessarily have access to. She had those things going for her. There's a point at which her mother, Florence Price's mother, asks her to write on her registration for New England Conservatory that she's from Pueblo, Mexico, so that folk will not think she's Black and she won't be treated as such. After that first semester, Florence Price would never pass again because the rest of her musical output was unapologetically Black in character and contributing to Black music, Black society, and Black musical society through her involvement in so many initiatives of, between Black musicians. After her time in Boston, she moved back to Arkansas where she taught at the Arkadelphia Presbyterian Academy for one year before moving to Atlanta in 1910, where she became the head of the music department at Clark Atlanta University. It was during this time she met attorney Thomas J. Price, whom she married in 1912. 
The prices moved back to Little Rock where Thomas established his practice and where Florence composed and taught students privately. Back in Little Rock, however, Florence was pitted against the ever-pervasive barrier of racism and segregation. She struggled to break through the white-dominated music scene and was refused membership to the Arkansas Music Teachers Association due to her race. In response to the unfounded rejection, she formed the Little Rock Club of Musicians, which allowed her to teach at segregated black schools. Racial tension in Arkansas was rampant during this time. Once a relatively comfortable place for black residents, Little Rock became overwhelmed by racially motivated crimes and attacks, including the lynching of a black man near Thomas's office. This increasingly dangerous environment prompted the Price family to make a decision shared by many black families in the South to move north in what has come to be known as the Great Migration. The Prices settled in Chicago in 1927, where Florence sought ways to enrich her musical life. She joined the R. Nathaniel Dett Club of Music and Allied Arts, continued to study composition and orchestration with figures such as Carl Busch, Wesley LaViolette, and Arthur Olaf Anderson, and got a degree in composition at the Chicago College of Performing Arts of Roosevelt University. Price also joined the Chicago Music Association, a group which sought to give a platform to African-American classical musicians nationwide. This is where she would meet Margaret Bonds, who became her student and close friend. I think the other factor that kind of puts Florence Price in a position to, to succeed is she was a part of the African-American classical music world. She was a part of the National Association of Negro Musicians or NAM. Um, they actually named a chapter after her, the Florence Price Guild. So that organization was and still is probably the greatest or most important organization for the advancement and preservation of classical music by Black people. And so by being a part of these, this organization in particular, she places herself in a position to get additional support. And I think her community was definitely behind her. Um, I've read uh, stories of people gathering, Black people gathering at her house, different musicians gathering to help her even copy out scores, you know, little things like that. Just being a part of a community helped her so much. It's important that when we look back, we look at Florence Price in this intersectional lens where we see her gender, where we see the colorism, where we see her identity when she chooses to walk through life unapologetically Black, that that is a choice to engage with a certain type of oppression head on. Um, and we also have to look at that dynamic of class as well. What did that class give her access to? But then how did she pay it forward? Well, Florence Price paid it forward by teaching at Clark Atlanta University. She also taught in schoolhouses in Little Rock, Arkansas. She had no qualms and no hesitation about going back to Little Rock to give back to her community when before she did go to Chicago, but she spent years giving back to that community, giving piano lessons, giving organ lessons, and passing on the knowledge she had in these various schools. She was so busy, you know, it, as um, and had children, multiple children, and was with, married and was doing all of the trapping, performing all the trappings of, you know, a, 90, a, a 20th century marriage, um, the sort of heteronormative vision of a marriage we have. She fulfilled all of those things on top of her talent as a composer. And then finally, the probably the last major rift that, I mean, in her personal life was when she divorced her husband and moved all of her children to Chicago. She, she chose some challenges in her life in pursuit of her artistic freedom, in pursuit of making a music that represented her identity without compromise. And I think that's, that's a, uh, a testament to her power as a composer and her tenacity and strength as a woman. So I've, I've had discussions with individuals who Again, pointing, pointing back to the fact that she was a Black person and she was also female. So she had so many things kind of uh, working against her in that time period. She was married at one point and then became a single mother at another point in her life. I think, and this is just my opinion, 
I wonder sometimes if she approached each piece as if this could be the piece that helps my career to take off. This could be the piece that opens up the doors. It's almost like she didn't have the space to just make something forgettable or, you know, simple. Everything is memorable, beautiful, majestic. And even if with the more calm, reflective pieces, you won't forget them. They, they, they kind of tug at your heartstrings. And I think she, I think she just knew that every piece of music needed to be of a certain caliber. And obviously she had the chops to deliver with each and every piece. In 1928, G. Shermer and McKimley publications began to print and sell her compositions, which included instrumental manuals, songs, and piano music. Financial hardship and domestic abuse pushed Price and her husband to divorce in 1931. In order to support her two daughters, Florence worked as a composer for radio ads and as an organist for silent movie screenings. As a single mother, Florence moved herself and her daughters to live with Margaret Bonds, cementing a lifelong friendship between the two. It is this friendship that also connected Price to Langston Hughes, whose poem, Songs to the Dark Virgin, she would later on set to music and for which she would gain national success. She was also connected to renowned contralto Marian Anderson, who would perform Price's arrangement of my soul's been anchored in the Lord many times throughout her career. Were her songs done in her time? Absolutely. People like Marian Anderson, some of her songs were written for her. And she premiered um, My Soul's Been Anchored on the Lo in the Lord. That was her big piece from Price. So she was well known for her vocal writing and for the sounds. Um, African-American, well, women in general were pigeonholed a bit in that time and not getting their their due at all so she had that double strike she's a woman and she's an african-american so um her songs stand up it's just they weren't given an opportunity price and bonds both submitted entries to the wanamaker foundation awards where bonds was awarded first place in the song category for her piece sea ghost and price was awarded first place for her symphony in e minor this symphony was premiered by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 1933, making it the first piece by a female African-American composer to be performed by a major orchestra. When Price comes to Chicago with her daughters and her husband initially, and then she and her husband separate, she and her daughters lived with the Bonds. So Estella Bonds had a home that could accommodate her, but not only, and it was partly the time again, of, of African-Americans, the whole community wanted to see Florence Price and Margaret Bond succeed so that when Margaret, I mean, when Florence Price needed the parts for her symphony written out or concerto, the whole community would come and sit there at the table and write. So Margaret Bonds was a part of that, but she also learned a lot from the older um, Price in terms of composition, um, and in terms of text setting, because they were in the same circles, seeing Abby Mitchell and Will Marion Cook. And Abby Mitchell was that wonderful singer who was the first Clara in Porgy and Bess, but lived right there in Chicago with her husband. So she would do concerts and they would do, you know, home concerts and perform performances and churches and all. And they would get to hear this. So her influence on, on Bonds was huge. Um, and she had been, you know, she'd gone to the university, she'd gone to New England Conservatory. So she had already been a, a university trained musician. And so I'm positive that she was a big influence. And even um, after all, the two of them win the Wanamaker, because Price won two prizes and Bonds won one, but she's on the same program with Price. And so many times as I was reading, I, I recently finished reading the biography that Ray Linda Brown wrote, The Heart of a Woman, on Florence Price. And you see so many mentions of Bonds being present. And so it was, it was that close relationship where they're doing their own thing, but they are, they're working together as the African-American community at that time, the musical and artistic community very much did work hand in hand because they wanted, they had to create opportunities for, for each other and for themselves. 
Throughout her life, Price's work continued to be heard on a wide range of platforms, from the WGN radio station and movie theaters to large halls and major orchestral venues, namely the U.S. Marine Band, the WPA Symphony Orchestra of Detroit, and the Women's Symphony Orchestra of Chicago. We see these people that are these figures of this time as if they were like, yes, they were the glitterati, but they weren't much more different, much different than us. They lived in small cramped apartments. They moved in with family. They were struggling to pay bills, right? And in all of that, they create the words and the sounds that are, the, that are still the lifeblood for us today. So I don't think that there's one bitch mark, right? It is a, it's the totality of the woman, is the totality of the human of Florence Price that makes her so pivotal. Florence Price was obviously very driven and she was very bold. So Florence Price would actually take the time to write letters to conductors asking them to perform her works. And she would admit, look, I'm black, I'm female, but my music is worthy. And so I think if you had just one of those things, she wouldn't have become the success that she was because it would be so nice to have all of this um, exposure as, as a child and as a young lady and then do nothing with it. But she also was tenacious uh, and she was a leader in her community. Not only was she a part of the community, but she was a leader. She was well-respected. Um, she involved the community even at uh, meetings, she would do demonstrations. She would allow people to sing her compositions. And so she was really a part of the fabric of the African-American classical music scene. And then she was also smart enough to write in other styles and to write for a variety of instruments and voices. So you put all of that together and you get Florence Price. So she wins this prize in 32 her piece is performed, her symphony is performed by the Chicago Symphony, and yet she can't get other symphonies to perform it. Um, Price was very light-skinned and had, people had um, often told her she should, you know, pass for white and not have to go through some of those barriers, and she refused. She had to continuously fight for her music to be recognized, um, she, would, she was tenacious in her attempts to send scores to major publishers so that they could be widely distributed. Um, she kept a journal where she wrote each date where she sent out a score and what replies she got. So she was very methodical in keeping track of her rejections and acceptances. And when I went to visit the archives, I was kind of sh shaken by how how many rejections she received and how much she kept going, or how many just non-responses she received. So it's, Florence Price was very aware of the handicaps facing women composers and black composers. The other piece of that puzzle was, yes, she could have chosen to pass, but she chose not to. And that idea that one would choose not to and would choose their black identity is quite subversive. Because if you think of the respectability politic of the Harlem Renaissance, yes, we look back at that with rose-colored lenses and see that it's a time when Black folks were defining themselves and they were writing music and creating art that was pro-Black and that was for us. But it wasn't just for us. It was for the white gaze. It was still honoring that white gaze and how they saw us. So every piece of, every artifact we put out had to be manicured, had to show the best of us, could not show us as fully human. Price's organ compositions were played in many Black churches in Chicago during her lifetime, and her songs would be sung by renowned singers such as Roland Hayes and later on, Leontine Price. She was influenced by African-American rhythms and melodies and arranged many spirituals, some of which were dedicated to and performed by her friend, Marian Anderson. Florence Price was self 
aware, as Black people must be. We must be aware. Um, and W.E.B. Du Bois talked about this, Du Bois talked about this in his idea of the double consciousness theory in the souls of Black folk. The idea that Black people live behind the veil, that they must put on the mask of whiteness to negotiate life beyond that veil of the color line, and then life behind that veil when they can be them, their true selves. And so Black people represent this fractionated self, the self that we have to put on to be safe in white dominated environments, and then the self we put on when we are in these safe uh, environments for us. Um, so the, the issues and the, the intersectional challenges facing Florence Price are very similar to Black women composers today, unfortunately. Much work has been done to find, gather, and reconstruct Price's lost works, some of which have even been found under the floorboards of a rundown house on the outskirts of Illinois. There is actually a story in The New Yorker that kind of outlines exactly what happened. And basically what happened is that there was a young couple, they were getting ready to renovate an old home, which was just outside of St. Anne, Illinois. And so there was actually a hole in the roof. And in the corner, there were these boxes and papers, or I shouldn't say boxes, but there were papers that were just kind of scattered there that somehow didn't get wet all these years. It's amazing to think that after all these years, these documents, these papers, uh, entries into like uh, diaries, all kinds of things, programs were found in this corner, they were dry and they started to look through them and they noticed that this name kept coming up, Florence Price, and they were kind of curious. So they did what most of us would do today. They Googled her and they found out that she was a, a composer that lived in, in the area. This was actually her summer home. And um, they decided to call the University of Arkansas Library to see if they would be interested in having the documents. And of course, the University of, Li University of Arkansas Special Collections there in the library, they were super excited to find out that these papers existed. Um, there are scholars who knew uh, that these papers existed, Dr. Raylinda Brown being one of them, and they just didn't know where they were. And so that couple turned over the, the papers to the University of Arkansas Special Collections. And as a doctoral student, I took a trip there and I just, I had a field day kind of reading through a lot of the documents. I wish that my trip could have been longer because it was so interesting to try to get to know Florence Price through these papers. She wrote songs like Sympathy to the words of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And one of my favorite things about that piece is he is expressing a generation before her the pain of being trapped and unable to flourish as, um, as, a, as a citizen of the United States who happens to be of color. And so she takes that and marries it to the language that she has, her own musical language. And you can hear the pain in the chromaticism and in almost a wail at the end, where she says, I know why the caged bird, what the caged bird feels or why the caged bird sings. That's, she's saying, I understand why, what that feeling of being trapped is about. And I always say that he was the first internationally known black poet and she's the first internationally known black female composer. And it was an interesting, um, in her time, that's her collaborator, even though they weren't the same generation.
texture and um, flow to her songs. She kind of takes you in the direction of where, you, where you're supposed to phrase in such a way that you cannot unphrase those songs. And she does that, for example, in Songs to the Dark Virgin, the never ending, I believe it's six, I can't remember if it's eighth notes or sixteenth notes, but it just continued this continuous right hand movement with a slower left hand pedal like motion creates this wonderful cushion for singers. I mean, I'm, I teach singers a lot, but when you have a continuously moving accompaniment, it does something for the breath. It allows you to feel like there's more breath that you can subdivide and that the phrases, even if they're long, you can sustain them longer. Um, so she's very sensitive to singers. And you can tell that Florence Price, she led singing groups. She had her own treble choir in Chicago that she worked with, which was a women's choir. And there were a lot of those around at the time, a lot of um, women's and women's music organizations, um, particularly a black women's music organizations. So you can tell that she had the sounds of what a choir could do, what they could sustain in her ear. So particularly to her songs, there's this lyricism that's quite beautiful. song called The Washer Woman, which was all about a Black woman domestic who spent her days in, day in and day out washing the clothes of white folks. And she tells it from her perspective, and she gives this woman her own voice in the song. And I compare it in my dissertation to Schubert's Gretchen am Spinrad, where he, she, he creates the spinning wheel, and that spinning wheel represents both the spinning wheel and the interior um, anxiety and draw, you know, the doldrums of going in and out doing the same thing every day. He, she creates a washing motive based on a Neapolitan chord that repeats and it shows, feels, helps the listener to envision the washerwoman washing the clothes and rocking back and forth and being stuck. And I argue about how that, that voice was so needed at the time and it was so rare to have black women telling their own stories from their own perspective. In fact, the poem was written by a black man about a domestic woman and there's a moment at the end of it um, what, where the, the onlooker says, what hast thou now but thy dusty tears? And I argue, you know, when it's a Black man writing about a Black woman, and it reads as sort of a judgment of, why are you still doing this? But when Florence Price writes it, with the dramatic setting that she sets up, it's, it reads as this sympathetic onlooker that says, get up, sister, and there's more for you, and I'm sorry it's still like this. And so I see that when Florence Price chooses to write a song like that, when alongside her songs about nature, alongside her songs by setting Lawrence Dunbar, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's texts, 
she is again trying to bring all of these identities into one place without sacrificing them without putting them on another table or in another room uh, she is problematizing respectability at a time when respectability was the ethic and so Florence Price was remarkably forward thinking. Not only was her music modernist, so almost Afro, I say Afro romantic, some people say Afro romantic, I say Afro modernist, because her music just tears down all distinctions of genre and all the things we would expect from a typical art song. She keeps some of those things, but oftentimes the harmony could tell you that it's a jazz piece or that this is a blues song. Florence Price remained kind of grounded in. Uh, profoundly lyrical approach, and particularly in her art songs, profoundly lyrical approach, and profoundly, you still heard the vestiges of romanticism in her music. Uh, so, though she does have some songs that really push the boundaries of harmony and are more chromatic, the core of the melody is always the primary in impetus. You know, she's always thinking about where does the melody live, and that is always the thing that makes it still sound tonal, even if the harmonies are going all over the place. Well, I first heard of Florence Price uh, when I started to dive into more musicological research when I was at Westminster Choir College. I spent, I think ever since Westminster Choir College, I've spent equal parts time researching and then performing, which I feel very excited and blessed to do. Uh, but I did a research part project on George Chadwick's uh, symphonic sketches and then one of his symphonies, um, comparing and contrasting the aesthetics. And through that research, I realized that he had taught Florence Price um, just through, you know, searching various databases. Florence Price started to pop up and I said, hmm, what do I know by Florence Price? So I picked up that Willis Patterson anthology of African American art songs and I paged through that and I discovered Night by Florence Price. And I decided to, you know, try to sit at the piano, sing it, and play it. And I was immediately struck by the, the unique quality, the, the, the unique quality of her music, uh, the sounds. It, it sort of is a combination of sort of French modernism and African um, diasporic sounds that we expect, pentatonicism and um, spiritualistic quotations. But then within this framework of sort of late 19th century, early 20th century harmony, and it, was, it just was immediately so appealing to me, uh, of the synthesis of so many styles that sounds so uniquely priced. Well, it's so beautifully crafted. I mean, it's, it's a, a, a little piece of heaven, isn't it? Night is, is there's no blemish about it. It's, it's seamless, it's perfect. Um, and that's kind of the hallmark of Florence Price's work. Um, there's, uh, every, every individual song has those same sort of elements. You don't find a dud among them. Do you? You, you, you go through them and you say, well, surely there's one where she's just thinking or just you know, developing an idea. But no, they're all really kind of uh, entire. Um, I think that that has to do with um, the immediacy for which she was writing, that she, she had a performance that she was writing for a, a particular performer and that she she there's an economy of means i've got to make an impact inside of these uh these three minutes
the 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 thing I would say in closing about Florence Price is actually not about Florence Price. Um, is that what I have witnessed lately is this this grand focus on Florence Price, which I think is amazing. I'm glad that people are interested in her, and it was kind of a, a wonderful moment as for me as a doctoral student, because as soon as I started working on the research, everybody suddenly became so interested in Florence Price. But what I want to say is that there are many other African-American composers that deserve all, all of the attention and glory that Florence Price is getting. And I say that as a Florence Price enthusiast and as somebody who has spent a lot of time studying and focusing on Florence Price. I say, let Florence Price be the light that shines on all the other African-American composers. There are so many that we should get to know and that we should be performing their music, both living and deceased. And I hope that the attention that Florence Price is getting kind of turns into general excitement about African-American composers altogether. <laughs>